Hello and welcome back to the channel and thank you for joining me on another of my interviews. Another fantastic interview lined up for you today. I'm talking to Chris Coverdale. Now Chris, as if you don't know, has been um, doing some very interesting work trying to prevent wars in actual fact. He he uh, used to be, I've got written down here, as retired organisation development consultant uh, being just a YouTuber, I don't really know what that means, but we can we can ask him. And he used to run a group or is part of a group called Make Wars History. In other words, we don't want any more. Chris, uh, lovely to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, I'm Thank you very much. It's it, my pleasure. Um, I'm particularly interested in talking to you because y you have an argument which is backed up by the Acts of Parliament themselves, which is what makes this even more fascinating, that these, these various acts sort of almost contradict each other and, and, and make us all criminals if we pay our taxes effectively, uh, which is a, a curious position for somebody who is a, you know, an honourable member of society who wants to pay their dues only to find that uh, actually they might be breaking the law. Absolutely. So, and, uh, yeah. So, so Chris, just tell us a little bit about your background. Then, how did you get into all of this, and how did you work this out? Um, very quickly. Then, um, I was, as I say, an organisation development consultant, which is helping organisations to work together effectively, taking account of their uh, skills and abilities, and the systems and other things in the organization that encourage people to get things done together in a humane and decent fashion. So uh, that's how I did that for 25 years. And uh, I lost the company to a fraud. And so I set up another company, uh, training people really in creativity and innovation. And then I lost that to a fraud. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a lot of bad luck going on. Well, there. it's probably bad management on my part. But, oh. um, so uh, I started to investigate fraud and corruption in Britain, in uh, businesses, in boardrooms and in um, government departments. And uh, unsurprisingly, everywhere I looked, I found it in spades. In wow. Just yes. In FT100 companies and um, six or seven different government departments. And I was looking at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in uh, 2002, and um, I discovered that we had been deceived for more than 70 years. Uh, well, at that time, it was probably 60 years um, over the illegality of war. Um, our government kept claiming that their wars were legal and um, had been authorized by the Security Council. And I... Um, I wondered about this and I thought, how on earth can it be legal? Uh, so I started to investigate what was going on. I had a look at the law and to my horror, I discovered these issues that we had signed various treaties and international agreements um, promising never to wage war and never to threaten or to use force to settle all disputes peacefully. And... Um, and so on, and uphold human rights and many other basic agreements we'd made with the rest of the world and that our government was breaching it. They had already gone into Afghanistan and were murdering men, women and children in uh, hundreds and even thousands in uh, Afghanistan. And we're about to go into um, Iraq on the same basis. And so uh, I was together with a few colleagues, uh, three colleagues, we went to, took the issue to court, to the High Court, and tried to get an injunction against Tony Blair and the Cabinet to uh, stop the Iraq War. And that was, um, however, it didn't get very far. In fact, it failed on the grounds that we had not provided evidence of intent to commit uh, genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. And it was most unlikely to happen. And uh, the second argument was that we said was that um, if it happens, we like if we go to war with Iraq, then Iraqi terrorists and others will come and uh, attack us. 
and uh, in London and other places. And so we don't want that. So, no. But both of those arguments were turned down as not in any way credible. And um, so we failed on that. And uh, so we went to war with Iraq. And um, so I started a campaign really to write to um, various people, to the um, head of the Metropolitan Police, Lord Stevens at the time, to say, look, this is a criminal offence. Uh, because by then I had started to look into the acts of parliament which make it a criminal offence to um, kill another person. Now, it is important to remember that in 2000 and 2001, two international statutes were brought into law in the UK. The first one was the Terrorism Act 2000 and then the followed in the following year by the International Criminal Court Act 2001. Now, both of these ratified international statutes and uh, conventions, uh, treaties, whatever you like to call them. And the particularly the International Criminal Court Act had not only brought into the jurisdiction in Britain, for, of the International Criminal Court, and we had agreed for the first time in 1600 years to uh, allow uh, an outside jurisdiction authority over every British citizen. So, um, and of course, nobody told us about this, but no. literally, it hadn't happened since the time of the Romans. Um, so what, what was agreed was that we would put ourselves, the Queen at that time, put herself and everybody else in Britain under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court in The Hague for uh, six crimes. And the crimes were war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide was three of them. And the other three are conduct ancillary to war crimes, conduct ancillary to crimes against humanity, and conduct ancillary to genocide. And this had been agreed and brought in and came in on the uh, 1st of September uh, 2001, I think it was. And then on the 7th of October, Tony Blair had uh, committed the criminal offences of crimes against humanity and genocide by taking us to war and killing Afghans because they were Afghans. So I was appalled by this and um, started to say, look, we've got to uphold this law. So I uh, wrote to the police to try and get them to uphold it. I wrote to, uh, um, over a period of time, over the next three years, we never got anybody to really do anything. We tried in Parliament, we tried to get a group together of um, QCs and senior MPs and others who were anti-war at the time. And um, a colleague of mine arranged for a letter to go to the ICC um, to in The Hague, accusing our uh, leaders of cr these crimes and asking them to take action. Now, 17 of these people will sign that letter and it went off but within about a month to six weeks all but two of those people had dropped out of the group um there was elfin floyd of clyde cymru who stayed in for a while and john mcdonnell and uh, his friend jeremy corbyn so what happened was that that group really fell apart. We couldn't take any action. We tried to set up, as I say, an all-party parliamentary group, but it didn't work. And um, obviously things were going on behind the scenes to stop what was um, any uh, activity of ours that was against the war. That, and so uh, anyway, so all of that went on. And um, I'm rambling on a bit. No, uh, it's, it's fine. I was going to ask... put it into context... Yes, no, absolutely. And, and that's the essential thing. And what was the justification? Just can you just remind us what the justification Tony Blair had was for going to war to take the country and then break these conventions and, and basically the law? Well, it was um, the war with Afghanistan was that um, 
Afghanistan was hiding Osama bin Laden. And he had he said he had evidence that uh, Osama bin Laden had carried out the attack on the Twin Towers uh, in New York at 9-11, as it came to be called. And um, therefore, we had to go and get him. And because the Taliban were sheltering, well, was supposedly sheltering uh, Osama bin Laden, that's why we were attacking Afghanistan. He gave them two weeks to uh, a warning of this. Um, they couldn't come up with any uh, evidence at all that uh, they were sheltering um, Osama bin Laden. But um, we still went to war. I mean, it had been agreed with Bush and uh, others that mm. uh, we were going to attack and kill them. And what we now know is that it was all about the oil and uh, other things, minerals and so on. But um, so that was the thing. And Tony Blair had said it was going to be lawful and said, right, I have authorised um, our military, military forces. I think he had said that um, we're firing cruise missiles into uh, Kabul and uh, Kandahar and places like that. And um, so we started the war with Afghanistan. And then the same thing with Iraq. Uh, it was... Um, we had the same do document, didn't we? Did oh, we not? The, the, the document that, that turned out to be a complete load of old nonsense that was... About weapons else. of mass destruction. Yes. And, all that sort of stuff, and um, yes, Doctor David Kelly uh, apparently committed suicide in a in a woodland. Uh, no, that meant, I mean, he was definitely bumped off. I'm afraid. Um, a good friend of mine has been pursuing that for years, David Halpin, who is um, a senior retired uh, surgeon, and just cannot believe that mm. uh, any of the evidence and so on. Anyway, that's a different issue. Um, yes, but it was part of the uh, you know the Iraq the overall, thing. And ago yeah. we went we so we went to war, and again it was justified on the sort of thinnest veil of something. Yes, and what concerned me is that it is it is all totally against the laws which we have agreed. Right. Um, so um, let me just go through some of those. I think um, the first and most important one was the not the most important, but the first one was the Kellogg Brand Pact in 1928. We agreed with the major countries of the world, nations of the world, in the, um, it was called the, uh, the General Treaty for the Renunciation of War, 1928, came about because of the First World War and the horrors of the killings in the trenches and so on. Mm. And we said, we'd never go to war again and we'll settle all disputes peacefully. Now, by 1939, there were 63 nations signed up to that. And um, then we had the Second World War. Uh, we, Britain, um, uh, declared war on uh, Germany. And, uh, you know, we had horrors that 60 million people probably died as a result of the Second World War. So that was the second one in 1945. The second main law, which is really the primary law now, is the UN Charter. We, uh, the nations all agreed the UN Charter in 1945. And what it said was that we will never threaten or use force and we will settle all disputes peacefully. And uh, this is quite, I mean, it's quite clear that we had agreed that, and in 1946, and, you know, we came up, you might like to put up that thing on the 77-year... Um, um, yes, let me, uh, let me grab the file here. Here we go. That's it. So the Prime Minister and the Attorney General were claiming that the war with Iraq is legal and was authorised by the UN Security Council operating under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. And in particular, UN Security Council Resolutions 678, 687 and 1441. Now, that's what the government were claiming. But what we had agreed in the UN Charter, Article 2.3, is all members shall settle their disputes by peaceful means. Yes. 
and then in 2.4, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. Now, it couldn't really be clearer. No. And then, but anyway, obviously it wasn't to them. Now, the important bit is actually in uh, Chapter 7 of the, of the UN Charter. Chapter 7 governs the actions of the Security Council. And the important clause or article is Article 41. The Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to its decisions. Now, I couldn't believe this when they said that it had been authorised by the Security Council. Um, it made no sense at all. Here they were. The secu Article 41 says not involving the use of armed force. and. Blair and the Attorney General and everybody else in the government was saying, no, we've been authorised to use armed force under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. And uh, they just leave it out the word not. I mean, I, I find it quite incredible that nobody in the government was even prepared to look at what we had agreed in the UN Charter. It's probably the most uh, common statute worldwide and available to every citizen in the world really and and presumably then they weren't challenged by the mainstream media or other individuals at the time to say hang on hang on a minute mate look at the paper here it says not not yes. to use armed force yes and um, um, you know we tried and we could not get any air time or anything else um, and, you know, one or two MPs, um, we tried to persuade them to do it, but um, nobody really challenged the government to say, no, this is criminal. Mm. Now, the point about it was that was the agreement made in the United Nations um, Act of 1946. Now, you can't take action. Perhaps you'd like to put that one up as well, because yeah. this is the authorization for Britain to take action. And uh, the 1946 Act actually very clearly states in uh, the first three lines of the number one is the measures under Article 41. Now, we had to bring this in in order for the king, as the commander in chief of the armed forces, not to commit treason. We cannot use Britain's armed forces overseas under other people's command um, without committing an act of treason. But here it says very clearly, if under Article 41 of the Charter of the United Nations, signed at San Francisco on the th th uh, 26th day of June, uh, 1945, sorry, I'm yeah. saying, <laughs> Are you the, the article which relates to measures not involving the use of armed force. Now, that's very clearly, and the rest of it goes on to say the king has to uh, authorise this in, um, in council, and by an order in council. And uh, at this time, obviously, it was the queen who was doing this and authorising the use of Britain's armed forces overseas um, in breach of the United Nations Act and every law we have in this country. And I couldn't believe it when we really started to look at it. What on earth are they doing? Mm. They know it's a criminal offence and they are moving ahead with it all the time and murdering men, women and children as a result of it. So... And it's not as if the, the, the country here was under imminent attack and it was either them or us. It wasn't one of those situations where you know, we were being bombed or got at or anything that we had to defend ourselves. <clears throat> well, Tony Blair, Tony Blair tried to prove that and saying that, well, uh, Saddam Hussein is threatening us and we can uh, be these, attacked these, within 45 these, minutes or something. And, yes. uh, you know, there's weapons of mass destruction which have to be um, removed, uh, destroyed. So he tried to show that it was self-defence, but of course it wasn't self-defence at all and never mm. never has been. And unfortunately the Queen, 
had got so used to just signing off on the orders that she had broken this fundamental law, which we've agreed never to wage war and never to use force. And 28 times since the um, since she came to the throne. Wow. Now, I mean, it's just unbelievable, really. Um, you know, Britain, British forces overseas, murdering men, women and children, um, wherever, for 28 times, yeah. illegally. There was yeah. only one legal, possibly legal um, war, maybe two. Uh, the, uh, the first one was the Falklands War when Argentina attacked us. Now, under sec Article 51 of the UN Charter, you are allowed to use armed force to defend yourself and repel the attack from your uh, territory. Yes. And uh, that is quite clear under Article 51. But, uh, and that was the case possibly with uh, the Falklands War. But um, even then, the, the concept of Mrs. Thatcher ordering a British submarine to sink the Belgrana outside the exclusion zone was a, a war crime, a horrendous war crime at the time, but she got away with it. And um, she even benefited from it, you know, the rah, rah, rah for war, and all the British public were behind her. Mm. So <clears throat> going back to the principle, and there's 28 wars have been, illegal wars have been fought, and we just seem to do it as a habit in this country. We go to war murdering men, women, and children, and no one is ever held to account for it. And that is the problem that we're trying to address in that we were trying to address in Make War History. So we said, right, let's uh, write to every police force in the country and try to get them to uphold the law, the International Criminal Court Act. And we, uh, we made nearly over 300 approaches to every police force in the country, to MPs, to um, the uh, House of Lords, to various others, um, to try and get somebody to uphold and enforce the law. And uh, now five of those um, did get as far out. This was over the following what, five, six, seven years. It, five of those reports did get as far as the Crown Prosecution Service. So um, the, what happens is if you go into a police station and you report war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, the process in this country is that they have to pass that on to a unit at Scotland Yard in SO15, which is the anti-terrorism unit, and the unit is called the War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity Unit. And it's their responsibility to prosecute or to investigate and bring prosecutions um, for those crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. But I and can't imagine that there were very many people employed in that department or that they were doing very much throughout this period. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> there weren't. And it was... Um, there were two or three officers, and we. Uh, well, I was. They rang me up and said, "Can you come and uh, Bel to Belgravia Police Station, and we'll take the evidence that you've got." And so I spent nearly fifteen hours giving over evidence in detail, and five sessions of three hours at a time with the officers from that unit, going through the detail of how our leaders were committing criminal offences or war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, and naming perhaps 25 of the top people who were involved. Now, for the first couple of hours, they were pretty um, dismissive of the whole thing, you know, mm. it's just, and, uh, but however, when we went through the detail and said, look, this is what the law says, this is what has happened, it's quite clear that it's a criminal offence. And um, so after a couple of hours, they started to realize that, yes, there's something here. Eventually, they passed on the information to the Crown Prosecution Service to say, right, we need to take the next step. And the Crown Prosecution Service had the case for about a month. And then we heard that the woman who had originally taken it on had, had left it over to somebody else and been uh, moved upwards to uh, Lancashire or somewhere else in the Crown Prosecution Service. And uh, 
the, she passed it on to probably the most junior person in the office. And about two months later, we got a message back saying, no, we're not going to go ahead with the prosecution on the grounds that you have not provided evidence of intent to commit war crimes, evidence of intent to commit crimes against humanity, or evidence of intent to commit genocide. Now, uh, we had provided masses of evidence. We'd mm -hmm. written it all into a report accounting for genocide. Um, and it was quite clear that it was done there. So that something was going on in the uh, Crown Prosecution Service to ensure the case never got to court. Now, the DPP at that time was Keir Starmer. <laughs> and uh, so he knew perfectly well that uh, crimes had been committed. Uh, interesting enough, about uh, three or four years ago, when he got into the, uh, the Labour Party, he was saying before um, Jeremy Corbyn uh, uh, was kicked out, um, that uh, he knew that the war was... Uh, illegal. Now, if he'd known that the war was illegal, as the DPP, he was the one person in the country who could have started a prosecution against Blair and others for the crimes, those crimes in detail, but he didn't. He turned it down. And I mm. find that's horrendous because his job is to prosecute people for um, criminal offences. Yes, and, interesting. Uh, the, the excuse is never, it never holds. So um, God knows what, <laughs> what they really get up to over there. But anyway, so that was one of the things that we did. And mm. um, we are still trying to do that and trying to get some of our leaders held to account in court for the criminal offences they have committed. Now, so the there's a whole other area of law that I came up with later, which moves us into the tax resistance side. Mm. Yeah. When I was looking through the International Criminal Court Act and the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, um, Article 52 of the International Criminal Court Act, which is the uh, British legislation, or the English and Welsh legislation, there's a separate Act of Parliament for Scotland. Um, when I was looking at it, Article 52 makes it quite clear that conduct it's a criminal offence of conduct ancillary to crimes against humanity, war crimes, and uh, genocide. If you uh, commit these crimes in this country, you can be liable, can be tried, convicted, and punished for up to uh, with up to thirty years in prison. This is what the law says, and it, I looked at what what do they mean by conduct ancillary to genocide? And in detail, what I realized after a while is that anything where it's aiding and abetting the criminal offense, uh, you can be prosecuted under the, um, under the legislation for, uh, and be imprisoned for up to 30 years. When I looked at the international legislation, it said quite clearly under the Rome Statute, Article 25.3c, I think it is, um, it, aiding and abetting such a crime is a criminal offence. And at the bottom of that um, uh, section, they say, including providing the means for the commission of the crime. And that was very clear to me that it means the money, the weapons, the troops, the training, all the resources that go into um, murdering men, women and children in warfare. And so when I realized that, I thought, well, every time I pay tax, I am making a small but significant contribution to the murder of more men, women and children overseas. Yes. And um, so anybody who pays tax is doing that. So I started to say, well, I've got to stop. So I stopped paying uh, council tax. That was the biggest uh, chunk of money that I was... Um, due to pay that I had control over. Um, yeah, I was going to say, because some of the tax, of course, is out of your hands, like fuel duty or PAYE and, other th and, and VAT on products that you buy. But council tax is a straightforward demand that you pay in a chunk, as you say. Yes, exactly. 
And um, so I stopped paying that then, and I haven't paid any council tax since then, on the grounds that it is a criminal offence for me to hand it over. And how does that go down, just as a matter of interest? How does that go down with the council and or the, uh, the legal system? Well, uh, because I've been doing it on my own, it doesn't go down at all well. Uh, they, I, they refuse to even look at the law sometimes. I mean, I couldn't believe it when a judge sentenced me to go to prison. Um, she said, uh, well, that law doesn't apply in this court. That's and this is odd. the most important criminal law we've ever signed up to, uh, aiding and abetting genocide. And um, so she sent me to prison. Be- Gosh. I mean, it's just it. That was when I realised that our court system is so corrupt. That, so I don't, um, I don't, what I don't understand there, and I'm sure people will be agog as they hear that, that um, laws of the land that we've signed up to that is part of our our legal system can be selected, it sounded, as if, oh, well, that doesn't apply here. And, and well, why would that not apply? Uh, could you tell us, uh, before you go in, it's almost like, can you just give me a list of the, a menu of the, the laws that apply here so that I know whether my case is actually has a chance of winning? Or yes. do you just strike them off because you don't want that one to apply? <laughs> You, you know, it does sound. It sounds like a pick and mix at Woolworths, not the Woolworths. Yes, it does, exist, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. You're quite right. The pick and mix is, um, and unfortunately, I mean, How... when the example is given by the, our leaders of leaving out the word "not" involving the use of armed force mm. and saying it's legal and lawful, you know, um, what can we do? I mean, they, they break every law in the book. And of course, courts, magistrates' courts, and so on, are instructed, in a sense, to um, pay no attention to people like me and others who uh, try to bring it to their attention. Yeah. So this is really why um, so I discovered um, back in uh, 2016 that there were other ways. I had originally gone into court assuming that it was a genuine operation, and uh, but so many occasions both in the high court the county court the magistrates courts and so on had made me realize that no it's corrupt to the core at every level and um, there are certain crimes which are taking place which the courts support rather than prevent so if we had the system that um, seems to have been around at one time that has been driven out and hopefully will come back the trial by jury um, of of you know natural law, a natural way of approaching it that you had been placed instead of just the magistrate who could do his pick and mix or her pick and mix and, and be selective, that uh, 12 just men from your peers could look at that and say, well, hold on a minute, that does sound like it's illegal, that should not be lawful, that's not lawful, killing people and they've agreed to... We wouldn't be in this situation at all. Absolutely. How no, long... No, no. How long did you go to to, to prison for? <laughs> I was sent to prison on three occasions. Uh, oh, in 2013, 2014 and 2015, I think it was. can't remember now. Um, for a total of 98 days, but I served 51. Right. Is this in a sort of an open prison or...? Uh, some of it was. Uh, initially, they sent me to Lewis, being my local uh, prison, which is a very nasty place indeed. Um, it look, it look, I mean, I know Lewis prison, not to go in. I hasten to <laughs> add in case anyone's <laughs> casting aspersions. But you go past it, it's very austere looking as, yes. as you pass it. And it is. It's Victorian. It's full to the brim with uh, people. They've got too many people in cells and everything else. Uh, one interesting thing about that was that um, that you have, as a civil prisoner, I had not committed a criminal offence. I was just um, not paying debts, as right. they say. And so it's the old debtors' law, which has really gone out for every debt except for council tax. Oh, interesting. So there are about um, 100 people a year who are sent to prison for non-payment of council tax. I think I'm the only one that's been sent to prison three times but, <laughs> for that. But anyway, um, so, yes, it's a very nasty place. And uh, I 
kicked up a bit of a fuss there. And after nine days, they sent me to Ford, which is an open prison. Mm. The, that was a 42-day sentence. So I served the rest of it at Ford. Oh, well, well done for you. This is a little bit more pleasant at Ford. <laughs> Slightly, pre- pre- yes. Well, pre- I mean, again, I've, I've, I know Ford as well from passing, whizzing past. And it, it's, yes. it, it seems a bit more like Butlins than, than the, <laughs> the, colditz, the colditz of Lewis. Absolutely. Very good analogies. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, and that's only from the outside. I've, I've never ventured in. Um, but so it's, it's interesting what you say there. So w- w- there are a lot of people, um, as a, no doubt you're aware, and I've got some more guests coming up on the show um, who are trying to find ways to s- stop um, paying certain taxes like the council tax by asking where's the liability order and this sort of thing. And there the, seems to be ways of doing it and, and other ways of getting into severe trouble, uh, depending yes. on your pick and mix legal system that you that you have. Um, the, the, the thing that drew me is this this whole business of as a law abiding, caring, honourable member of the public, a, a, a living man, to use that sort of phrase, nobody wants to be paying a corrupt law-breaking organization that is causing genocide and going to wars and as you so eloquently pointed out the government is clearly breaking these laws that they themselves have signed which again is like the the parties at number 10 during the lockdown it's that sort of one rule for us and one rule for everybody else which is intolerable you can't have a society like that so where are we now then with this situation? Um, yeah, good point. I think uh, this, in a sense, it refers back to my background in organisation development. Really what I was about for most of my life is finding solutions to problems. And um, so really what I've been focusing on since 2003 is what are the solutions we can bring to bear to, to end war, to end the criminal offences being um just promoted by our leaders mm. uh, so i focused on that and i thought the first one obviously was to uh, object to war and to try to i joined this the big march in 2013 and so on but i realized after a while that marching demonstrating protesting putting in petitions it really has absolutely no effect on government mm. policy yes so i started to look around well what how do nations change their uh, their governments? And I started to look at the history of successful revolutions. Uh, so I looked back in history and uh, I found that virtually every major change in society started with tax rebellion. So Magna Carta was a good example of um, a tax rebellion that was successful in In 1215, um, King John wanted to wage war in Aquitaine and asked the barons for the troops and money and so on. And and they said, no, no, enough's enough. Um, You may not have our money or troops unless you agree to our demands. And so they laid down 63 demands. And uh, five days later at Runnymede, he agreed to those demands. So what happened was that, in effect, we that tax rebellion, the refusal to pay the government, forced the government to agree to 63 new laws in a week. Yes, it's amazing, and, isn't uh, it? it? I mean, yeah. And it was a massive change in this country and lasted for, you know, hundreds of years. So that was a good example. Then again, there was the, um, the British Civil War, uh, sorry, English Civil English War. Civil. Uh, in the 1640s when um, the king wanted to introduce a um, ship tax uh, to all inland towns and that started the civil war they didn't want to pay for his navy Uh, up till then it had only been um, seaside towns that had um, contributed to ships and the navy so that started that civil war Um, the 
the English Revolution in a way. Um, the next one was the American independence started because the king, the British king, introduced the stamp tax, which was the equivalent of VAT and tea taxes and other things. And uh, they said, no, no um, more tax, no taxation without representation. And they, the king refused representation in parliament. So they uh, became independent. Uh, the French Revolution, same thing with the bread taxes in Paris, the Russian Revolution with the land taxes for the peasants in, um, in Russia. Uh, Indian independence came about because of a salt tax rebellion Gan led by Gandhi. There were two other, um, well, lots and lots of uh, things, but two important ones. One was in 1915 in Britain, uh, the Glasgow Women's Rent Strike which was um, what happened was that the First World War started and a lot of the men in Glasgow were hauled off to the, um, the trenches and were fighting the war for the British. And, um, of course, their wives weren't getting any money to pay the rent. And so mm. they were starting to get thrown out, ejected from their houses. And they said, this is disgraceful. <laughs> we're not having it. They got the shipbuilders behind them and there was a strike. They said, no. Um, now, the shipbuilders, who were badly needed by the government, and the, the Glasgow women together forced the government to change the law on housing. And there were, they came in, the new law came in, you know, no rent increases and uh, no evictions. Now, that lasted through until the, the, the next one was Mrs. Thatcher changed that law in the mid-80s and uh, stimulated the poll tax rebellion. <laughs> I remember um, that so, well. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's probably that's the one that's at least in living memory. <laughs> mm. But um, so basically, what it what it taught me was that every effective change, when you change law and you change governments and so on, takes place because of tax rebellion. It is the fundamental issue. If a government hasn't got any money, mm. then it can't do these nasty things to us and to others. Yes. Uh, so I thought, right, we've got to start a tax rebellion. So that's why I started. And in 2010 or thereabouts, I was put on to the um, Terrorism Act 2000, uh, which is important because the world had agreed a statute, an international statute, uh, called the Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism. And they had agreed that in 1999. And today there are 188 nations have ratified that and brought it into their domestic law. And that's one of the most, that's the biggest signature, apart from the UN Charter, no other statute has gained so many uh, signatories. So in that, when bringing it to law in this country, it became a criminal offence to do three things. One was to ask for money, to collect money, or to pay money if you suspect, or if you have reasonable cause to suspect, that some of the money may be used for a criminal purpose, in particular for the purpose of terrorism. Right. And they define terrorism in section one of the, uh, the Act, Terrorism Act 2000, as the use of firearms or explosives endangering life for a political or ideological cause. So very straightforward. What we know is that our taxes are being used to endanger life, in fact, to take life. Yes. And we had taken since 2000, when they brought their law in, approximately 2 million lives. Uh, 1.4 million adults and 600,000 children we have murdered in that period of time. Despite this law, which says that it's a criminal offence to ask for money, to collect it or to pay it. And um, that's what the, what the law I'm saying, right. Um, now, when I go into court, not only will I uh, quote the International Criminal Court Act, but also the Terrorism Act 2000. Sections 15 to 18 are some of the most important in this country. So for the first time in history, not only uh, can we stop a war by refusing to pay tax, but for the first time, 
it is a criminal offence to pay tax. So we have the law on our side, and that's never happened before. Right. Uh, so so, has, previous... it, so this, has this been tested in the court? You, have you got a case coming up that you're doing this to, to effectively test it so that you know, people can go, well, here we are, case versus uh, Coverdale versus uh, His Majesty's government. <laughs> Regina versus Coverdale, or whatever yes, it is. That's it, yes, that's it, whatever they say. Um, no, because I mean, what's happened is that I've been doing this since uh, 2016, 2017, around about then. Um, when I, I've learned an awful lot more recently, but yes. I first started to realise that uh, I could go down this route for both those laws. And what has happened is that I've not paid council tax and I've written to everybody saying this is a criminal offence and so on. They just ignore me. So the best defence they've got is, oh, ignore this guy. Uh, if we take it to court, he's right. Yes. And, and it will immediately cause a precedent to stop the payment of tax and we can't have that. So, so, what, so are you saying that basically you're saying you just refuse to pay the tax, but you give them a reason because it's unlawful, and they'll go, right, well, we just won't deal with him. We won't do anything. They just leave you alone. Yes. <laughs> Basically, they just ignore me, you know. And, right. Uh, you know, they and, send round yes. uh, demands, and every time just somebody in the office is asked to send out 40,000, whatever it is, council tax demands, uh, and they send uh, the bailiffs round and that sort of thing. But... Um, they just completely ignore anything I say. And so what I realised was that we've got to do this on a bigger basis. If you yes. get 10,000 people all saying, no, we're not going to pay tax, then it might have some effect. Yeah. But until and it's not, then... It's not that you're saying, look, I don't want to pay tax because I don't want to pay for the bin men to come and take my bins away, you know, which is a, a, yeah. a laudable thing to do. It's just it is it is unlawful or it's illegal to be paying this because of this reason. It's just simple logic. Yes, exactly. I mean, we know that when you pay council tax, something most people don't know is that um, all the money goes into the government's consolidated fund. All Everything you pay in this country that is uh, taxation for all the 230 or so different sources of money into the government, it goes into one pot, which is called the Consolidated Fund. And that has been uh, the, uh, the rule since 1787. That's what happens. And the, all the money for all the services comes out of the same pot. Right. So that's a very simple way of thinking about taxation and um, budgeting. So, um, and that's the, that's know, their flaw, isn't it? That's their flaw then, because if the if the, your local council said, "Please give us the money, and we will then keep it in our own bank here and spend it just on the stuff we say we're going to spend it on," it would it wouldn't be potentially being used for other things by the government but because it's going to this central pot who knows where it's going and part of that money could well be going to fund wars etc etc and we know it is uh, mm, so if you right. look on the government's website you'll find that approximately 10 percent of every year's um, budget is devoted to the ministry of defense for the purchase of weapons and ships and aircraft and training people to fly them and, and then to wage war. And as mm. I say, we've waged 28 illegal wars on that basis since uh, 1940, 1952, I think, or 46, something mm. like that. So basically, since 2000, we know that British taxpayers have contributed approximately £1.2 trillion to the Ministry of Defence. Frankly. That's in modern day terms, you know, with yeah. inflation and so on. It's uh, I've just put it into modern day uh, money, and it, but it's an a more a, immense amount. Mm. I mean, uh, there's only what fifty million taxpayers at the most, and you divide one point two trillion pounds by fifty million, you see that the amount we've paid each is um, well over twenty thousand pounds each person in this country has contributed to mass murder and genocide 
And that, that, that uh, you know, that, that leaves a rather nasty taste in the mouth to think that's what we've been doing. Exactly. And, and, and not even had the choice to. I mean, not that one would want to choose that, but, you know, and, and as you also say, it's illegal to do it. Yes. And the important thing is that we think we don't have the choice, but we do. Right. And that moves me on to some of the other solutions that uh, we're trying to pursue. Um, there are a good uh, seven or eight major courses of action we can take. And so the first one is to actually stop paying it. The next thing is to actually put it into trust. Now, one of the, one of the principles I operate to is we need to use the system that they use against us, against them. And so one part of that system is the trust. Uh, the top 50,000 people in this country tend to earn huge sums of money and put it in overseas um, jurisdictions in trust. Right. And they use this trust process, the trust documents and um, law, to withhold the money from the tax ban in this country. So what I'm suggesting is, well, why don't we do that together in this country lawfully? So we set up a lawful trust and pay our taxes into the trust on condition that none of the money will be used for criminal purposes. And if any of it is, then they don't get the money. Right. They don't. So this is the benefit of a trust is that you know, it's rather like making a will for your grandchildren or whatever it is. You say, um, OK, I'll uh, leave £100,000 for Freddie if um, providing he doesn't marry um, Joan, Jeanette or oh, whatever. Yeah. And, um, and he joins the family firm or whatever it is by the age of 25. So if by the age of 25 he hasn't met those things and he doesn't get the money if he has right. and he does so, so exactly you've got an obligation onto the council or to the government to prove that they haven't used it for these wars exactly right and then once that's been proved which may be difficult for them um, well they can't if... because uh, <laughs> because this is where the other document comes in i mean this is um, the declaration of sovereignty and deed of discussionary Trust. I mean, you might like to put that up, and we could quickly work through it if you like. Okay, uh, we'll have to and uh, show people what it is. Yes, there we go. So let's have a look at this. Basically, what I've tried to do is to, in four pages, uh, it's probably come out a bit more on that version, but in four pages, uh, try to close all the loopholes and make it really tight. Uh, to ensure that the, no um, government body can take tax from us. So if you'd like to just go back to the heading, um, yeah. what it is is a declaration of sovereignty. So it starts off by saying, I am a sovereign man or woman, and I'm in charge, basically. Uh, it's not the government that is sovereign. It's not parliament that is sovereign. It's not the monarch that is sovereign. It is the people in this country. We are a democracy. And so we are sovereign human beings. So that's the first statement, is mm. the um, declaration of sovereignty. Then we say, right, that we're wanting to set up a discretionary, revocable, conditional trust. Again, this is the, the key phrase. It's in the top of the, um, the top phrase. That's it. Um, oh, I've sent you the wrong one there, but anyway. Um, so it's a con um, is that right at the top? It's uh, come yeah. across. Oh, uh, yeah. oh, ah, here we are. Declaration of sovereignty and deed of discretionary revocable conditional trust. Now, just explaining that, uh, the important bit in there is it's conditional. It's conditional on the conditions we write into the trust. Yeah. Uh, discretionary means that the trustees have discretion to do one or two things, and that's written into the document. And it's revocable because if the conditions are not meant, you can revoke the initial 
um, give to the primary beneficiary and put it on to secondary beneficiaries. So it's revocable rather than irrevocable. Right. So, so, so does, does that mean then that if they can't prove it, you, you basically can reclaim your money that you've put it, aside? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, on the very last page, the very last um, item there before you sign it is a declaration it goes right back to at the bottom there um, the last few lines, uh, where are we? It will be revoked on the last day of the financial year and all money and or assets held in trust for the primary beneficiary, that's the government, the council, etc., will be carried forward on the same terms and conditions to the following financial year or at the discretion of a trustee return to me, the settler, the secondary beneficiary. Mm. So basically, you get the money back, and uh, then you can pay it out to whichever um, cause you want to, whether it's just hanging on to the money, or if you want to support your local um, homeschooling unit, as I do in um, Sussex, there's um, uh, the homeschooling unit Hope Sussex, which is a great little uh, operation. And uh, also, I support a um, natural health group in Rye and so on. So I can put my money into that. So the advantage of this is that you're not saying I'm not going to pay, I'm, refu- I'm, I'm refusing to pay. You're just basically testing the law and saying, oh, I, I'm happy to pay it. It's just I put the money in trust with the obligation that you just got to prove that I'm not actually paying for any war crimes. And then I'm more than happy for you to spend the money and, and mend the roads and do the lights and blah, 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 and, and have that big fancy car that, you know, you'll see a, the, the man in charge or whatever. You know, you can have all that. Um, yes. That's effectively what you're saying, isn't it? And so, as you say, it's a lawful thing. You're just slightly challenging them that you can't just take the money willy-nilly and do whatever you damn well like with it because it's illegal. Correct. And it's both illegal in domestic law, in domestic... It's In every law you can think of, it is mm. a, a criminal offence, you know, in natural law, in... Absolutely, law. yeah. You're, you're you're doing harm, aren't you? So you you Absolutely. mentioned you. I'm I'm rushing you along a little bit now, just for for time. Right. Um, but you mentioned about eight steps, and I've written. I'm writing these down. So you've got to the second one, which is the trap. So in the first one, what you said, just don't pay it. Um, although of course there's consequences with that. The second one was don't pay it, but give them the trust option. Well, it's it's pay it, but pay, it. pay it on condition. And that's the big yes. difference. So you can never get sent to prison because you have paid it. You have right. paid it. I and see. it's quite important to realise in this situation that you not only are the set. it's called the settler in trust yes. law. You settle money into trust. You are also the trustee. Right. You put on a different hat yes. and you put it in a different box. It has to be in a separate account or a separate uh, box in your cabinet or whatever it is. But you say, I'm going to pay this money to the trustee as settler, and then the trustee has to meet the conditions of the trust. Yes. And it's their job to do that. And if the government meets all the conditions, then the trustee, you as trustee, with your other hat on, have to hand over the money to the government. Right. Uh, And if they don't meet it, you have to hand over the money to the secondary beneficiary whoever that is, and normally and what we're saying initially, let's make sure it is us. Yes. Well, why not? Uh, but, it, <laughs> it, but it could be a charity. It could be somebody it, else. Yeah. Absolutely. It, absolutely. And in longer okay. term, we need to ensure that we keep the country running. We, yes. But it's not those just about, things yes. that are lawful and obviously humane and not unlawful, illegal or criminal. Yes, Absolutely. I've got that. Yeah, no, that's good. That, that that's it. And I said, have is that tested? Have we tried that? Has that been tested? Well, yes, I've been doing it for a few years now. I've developed it very substantially, and I have a document there. That document, which I'm very happy for people to pass out and to copy it. Um, it's um, although it's got a copyright on it. I, the reason for that is that it's important not to change any of the wording of the law uh, in the trust document right because you can uh, you can make a mistake and, and fall foul yes because we've and seen fall in foul the past the law, but... how how important <laughs> wording is yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah absolutely 
So yes, it's available to anybody. And the point about it is that uh, previous versions, um, they, they don't know what to do. Mm. Um, they just ignore me, you see. So uh, what I'm saying is let's lots of us do this. Yes. The more of us that do this, the more likelihood we are to stop the money going to the government. And it's that money going to the government every every year, which is keeping them doing what they're doing to other people and to us. Yes. Well, that that's brilliant. That is brilliant. Gosh. And did, was there any other? You you I I'm only. Re- oh yes. I mean, I probably I shouldn't go through it all to, today. Maybe on another occasion. Right. We could okay. Pick yeah. up some of those other. Pick things. the other solutions. But, but this a, is the a key very one. simple one is prosecution and criminal prosecution. So what we have to do is to start prosecuting people under both the Terrorism Act and the International Criminal Court Act for fundraising for the purposes of terrorism or conduct ancillary to genocide. Uh, now, those are quite easy to prove. And uh, perhaps we haven't got time for it now, but I, I'd be happy to go through why and how we can prove that the government is committing genocide and has been since 2001. Yes. And, and we... so if we if we start a prosecution against either uh, senior leaders for um, the war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, or against um, people in the middle ranking or junior counsellors or whatever, for fundraising for the purposes of terrorism, we can start to bring real pressure to bear on the government and its agents throughout the country. So that's what I'm really saying is let's get a few cases going against a councillor or against uh, Boris Johnson or Tony Blair or whoever, maybe one of the chiefs of defence staff, for instance, it would Some, be a good idea. I can't remember who said it, but somebody said it to me: is if if you're able to prosecute the the the, the smaller people who are in, you know, almost the the councillors who are collecting it and dotting the thing, that and once they start to realise they're complicit in something, and they yeah. think, hang on a minute, uh, I'm being asked to, you know, what seems to be just collecting the money, but actually by doing that, I'm actually complicit in war crimes and genocide. Then suddenly they're going to sort of go, hang on, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm not prepared to do that. Yes. And, you know, because you can go after the big people and they'll get all their big, you know, lawyers and, and spend a ton of money deflecting and, and, and all that. But it, the, the people on the ground who don't know they are complicit uh, can turn around very easily and say, whoa, wait a minute, and, and either resign or, or just have an argument with their boss or whatever and convince them also because they've got suddenly, a, I, I'm being taken to court. Why am I being taken to court? And, and, and that would the, send a the, shiver up everyone, wouldn't it? Yes. I mean, the sentence under the uh, Terrorism Act is up to 14 years in prison, yes. whereas you can get uh, six months uh, for not paying council tax, but it's 14 years for asking someone to pay it. Yes. Knowing that it, some of it will be used for the purposes of terrorism uh, or for um, criminal but, purposes. And that is a very compelling argument to not to, to demand it. You know, I think if people realise that, they would yes. perhaps think twice. As soon as they realise, hang on a minute, I'm personally responsible for what's happening to uh, by, by asking for it. That's such and a, this is why... We, we need to get this going uh, internationally in uh, yes. every um, borough council in the country, uh, you know, district council or whatever. Um, and we have the opportunity right now to do that. And, uh, that, and that's only talking about half the problem. Genocide, um, very briefly, is not only dropping bombs on people and killing them, but um, using machetes to chop their heads off or whatever in Rwanda that's proven. Or... Um, poisoning them with um, poisonous inoculations, mm. and we've we've certainly seen a lot of that recently. Yeah, now so some of the people who are implementing that, they need to know they could be prosecuted for conduct ancillary to genocide because they are murdering men, women, and children, members of a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, which is the definition of genocide. So 
there are all sorts of possibilities. So the really what I'm saying is prosecution of criminal offences of people at different levels in Britain could be the answer to uh, a lot of our problems. Chris, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk it to us. And, and, and I'm sure people will be absolutely agog. I mean, it's the only word I can think of, agog at the, the fact, and, and you must have seen this as you've gone round explaining to people how that is, that a government and the, the, all the people involved who probably are, who don't know, but the fact that the, the main players in the government could possibly do this to not only their citizens, or, or the, their sub, yeah, citizens, I suppose, from a government's point of view, but other people across the world, willingly yes. and knowingly. And I think people will be utterly astonished that this, in this day and age, in the so-called civilised, sophisticated, cultivated world, would yeah. do that. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. No, delighted. That. And we'll get you back. And yes, we'll talk, we'll talk further. Well, as some of the other. Yeah. Thank you so I'll much. I'll be delighted. Chris. Brilliant. Well, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. If that has not sobered you up on a bank holiday Monday, uh, as I record this, and I appreciate people watch this at all sorts of different times, uh, then I don't know what will. But uh, a big thanks to um, Chris. I will put your document, if that's all right, Chris, as available um, to download. So people please, could, the declaration. Please do. Um, yes, I haven't got it on a website because my website's been closed down. But if you can put it on your website, please do download it and pass it around as many people as possible, sign it, get it witnessed, and send copies of it, not the original, to uh, the local council or to the energy company or uh, to the government, to the revenue and customs or the DBLA, whatever. Brilliant. So uh, we need to start with holding the money on the grounds that it's a criminal offence to pay it. There you go. Well, I'll be back with uh, more interviews, interesting interviews all this week. Uh, so do join me again. But from, from now, from Chris Coverdale and myself, take care and bye bye.